last time I surveyed the strength of all the Teen Titans to find out which of those good guys is the best. But now my attention turns to the dark side as I ask, who is the strongest Teen Titans villain? First, a necessary preface. For as many Titans as there are in the show, there are even more villains. So I'm gonna split them into categories. The Muscle, who are your big beefy boys, the Inventors, who tinker with tech, and the Magicians, who work within the realms of the arcane. Then there'll be this big miscellaneous category, before we conclude with the big bads themselves, the overall villains of each season of the show. I'll rank each villain within their category, and at the end of each section, provide an updated top 10 list for where we are so far. Because we have a lot of territory to cover, and I intend to be thorough, I've included timestamps in the description for when each of those main sections begins. In case you wanted to pause the video and watch it in multiple sittings, or Trigon forbid, actually skip sections. Like with the previous Teen Titans power ranking, I am only using examples from the original animated series and from the Trouble in Tokyo film. So I am not going to count comics, Teen Titans Go, or any other reference points that could sway these results. And in some ways, this is inevitably going to be a looser ranking because some of these villains have multiple forms. Some can be accompanied by minions and armies, and some of these villains have very situational fluctuations in their power levels from episode to episode. All this is to say that while I am trying to be as objective as possible, there's always going to be some wiggle room for debate as we go along. I am also defining a villain as a major threat that is a direct antagonist to the Titans. So for the purposes of this video, yes, I am counting Red X as a villain but I will not be including the following characters in this video. Soto, Valior, Turnier, the TV villains, any evil forms of the Titans, whether they're robots or heroes under mind control, and any villain that we don't see actually fight, like Rexilla and the driver of the villain bus, the infamous Bearded Man. But I will be including both Jinx and Terra. Yes, they were titans, but they were also villains, and since I already explained their capabilities in the Strongest Titans video, their sections this go-around will be a bit abridged. With all that Zarbnoff out of the way, let's start with the physically imposing heavyweights of the video, the muscle. Which, Mr. Steamroller, is where you come in? <laughs> These first three challengers have no lines, no discernible personality, and barely show up. Wrestling Star is a human wrestler. And that's all we know. I'm sure he has a tragic and deeply interesting backstory. But since we somehow haven't yet gotten a feature-length film about Wrestling Star, I'm gonna put him below Instigator. Or as I like to affectionately call him, I-N-S-T-I-G-A-T-O-R. He looks like some kind of Modoc wannabe that can stretch his arms and probably maybe do other things too. But Hotspot blasted him before we could see him test his might. Which just leaves Steamroller, who helped Instigator defeat Thunder and knock down Pantha. Steamroller was briefly featured in the episode Titans East, where he had the strength to punch Bumblebee through the roof and could, in fact, steamroll things with his arms together. While he can be knocked back, he's durable enough to survive being trapped in molten steel. But against the newly formed Titans East, under Cyborg's direction, he fell as expected, and later got overpowered by Red Star. Sir, yes sir, Private Hive's new motorcycle was originally half off, but with my five finger discount, it is free! Maybe he's more of a middleweight than a heavyweight, but I still think Private Hive belongs in this category of physical fighters. His main weapon is his shield, which can deflect Cyborg's arm cannon, and also, after he throws it, can return to him like a boomerang. Private Hive is smart enough to use his environment to his advantage, but loses to Jericho off-screen before getting possessed again by him in the episode Titans Together. 
I don't think Private Hive is as physically strong or durable as Steamroller, but he seems a lot quicker and a lot more adaptable to situations, so I think that would give him the edge. Now, I wanted to put Crawl dead last for the memes, because he's just so useless, especially compared to Cyborg and Saracen, and he keeps getting trolled by the Witch. But in all fairness to him, if we count Crawl in his monster form, I could actually see putting him two or even three spots higher on this list. It's just that, as a human warrior, Crawl loses solo to Cyborg, even when Cyborg is critically low on power. Whereas, fully charged Cyborg struggles to hold back Johnny Rancid's pet, Rex. Admittedly, I'm at a bit of a loss with what to do about some of these mechanical mini-bosses of the show. Like, I think that Slade's machine, Worm, might be remote-controlled, and therefore more like a weapon than an actual character. But then you got Rex here, acting like a dog, and I'm guessing that Rex has a conscious mind of its own. This mecha mongrel can easily smash up a car and rip it to shreds. Yet, for how threatening it can look, Starfire compares Rex to a playful pet from her own planet. I only hope that Tamaranians don't similarly take care of their own pets by playing fetch with them and then blowing them up. Man, I love crashing the ball. Mammoth is the first really recognizable villain in this list. Even if he doesn't say much, he often shows up with Jinx and Gizmo in High Five related episodes. Sometimes he can hold his own against Cyborg, but by the end of the show, Cyborg can defeat him solo off screen. I'd wager that while Cyborg has learned some new tricks and grown over the five seasons of the show, we haven't seen as much development with Mammoth. If anything, he actually gets weaker. In season one, Mammoth impressively lifts Elephant Beast Boy, but by season three, he can't lift a big stack of gold bars. In season five, he jobs to Panther and Red Star. I'm sure Mammoth could beat all of the real world's best hand-to-hand -hand fighters, but sadly for him, he lives in the world of Teen Titans, which contains so many heroes that could absolutely body him on any given day. And if Mammoth were to face Kitaro, I think his opponent would have the edge with his blade and his dirty tactics. The first time we see Kitaro, he proves himself as a martial arts expert by beating Robin in only three moves. Then at the end of the same episode, Robin Uno reverse cards Kitaro and defeats him in three moves. See, Kitaro had tried to make it up the mountain before, but couldn't. So while Robin grew from the trials, Kitaro followed Robin to avoid the challenge. Kitaro is strong, fast, and devious, while at the same time, not very adaptable or versatile. He is strong enough to beat the swordsman Bushido, but is sent flying by the Herald. Car is better than okay. Car is mine. It's time for two very situational villains. First up, everyone knows her, everyone loves her. She is the moment it's the iconic mind control squid. Frankly, I went back and forth on whether to even consider this its own character or more of a weapon. All we really know is that Brother Blood had made it somehow using Cyborg's technology and that Aqualad cannot communicate with it telepathically. The mind control squid is strong enough to break the Titan's ship, which is a really impressive feat, but Shark Beast Boy can bite through its robot tentacles, and the whole thing is lured easily into a trap and crushed by a big rock column, and alas, the mighty beast fell. Switching from water to the opposing element, you could say that Overload is proven to be the second strongest electric-type fighter in the series. Overload beats the third place Lightning, but gets absorbed by the first place Kilowatt. However, I don't think it's that cut and dry, because Kilowatt can get taken out in one hit by the Puppet King, whereas Overload can become so strong from absorbing electricity that it can eat Starfire's bolts. Overload is impervious to blaster fire, but has one of the worst weaknesses ever because it immediately loses if you get it wet. Of Slade's three recurring muscles for hire, Overload is the easiest to quickly defeat. But if there's no water anywhere nearby, you could be in for a real shock. Rock, 
drop it, Cinderblock, before we drop you. Cardiac is a seemingly sentient robot heart with strong vacuum tentacles. It's able to repair itself, and in its first encounter with the Titans, actually gave them quite a bit of trouble. But Cardiac can be defeated by Raven's magic, cut by Robin's birdarangs, and eventually defeated 1v1 by Beast Boy. So while I could see it stopping Mammoth or Kataro, I just don't have the heart to put Cardiac any higher. Meanwhile, Cinderblock is the biggest villain so far, if not in stature, at least in episode appearances. The first time we see Cinderblock is in the episode Divide and Conquer, and he puts up a solid fight against all the Titans together. He is shown to have both immense strength and physical endurance. While we never see how Cyborg later defeats Cinderblock off screen, I'd at least like to imagine it was a tough fight. In Apprentice Part 1, Robin was able to echo Cyborg by giving Cinderblock a private beatdown, and it looked pretty one-sided. But it's also possible that Slade had ordered Cinderblock to go down easier, you know, as part of his trap to secure Robin. While Mammoth seems to have been taken less seriously as the show goes on, Cinderblock occasionally gets a glow up. At the end of season two, when he keeps enduring all of their attacks, Starfire can be heard remarking that Cinderblock is, quote, unquestionably persistent. We see something similar in the season three episode Haunted, where he tanks Starfire's bolts and might even be physically larger than he used to be. Like, has Cinderblock been hitting the gym or drinking more milk or something? In my head, at least, Cinderblock is the poster child for the muscle type villain. He doesn't have special tricks or weapons or any powers of any kind. He's just big, tanky, and packs a huge punch. It's enough to land him about halfway through this list and about halfway in terms of all the villains in the series. Not too shabby for some conscious concrete. Worthless scum, you cannot defeat perfection. On a good day, I think Trident could beat Cinderblock. After all, Trident's not considered one of the fiercest threats to Atlantis for nothing. When there's multiple clones of him, one Trident is able to individually defeat Beast Boy and Aqualad separately, and even together when they're not fighting well as a team. When Trident returns riding on Plasmus, he takes out both Aqualad and Tram the Fish Boy. While Trident isn't as huge as most of the villains in this category, Trident's Trident is a powerful weapon. When Jericho controls Control Freak, his lightsaber can't cut through the Trident. As a villain, Trident is smart, strong, and a very capable threat, whether on land or in the sea. But his obvious flaw is his ego. When people mess with him or get in his head, he can be self-sabotaging or get overconfident, which in turn makes him far from perfect. A more focused predator is the Cyronillion Chrysalis Eater from the episode Transformation. She's a member of a species that can survive in space, hop between space rocks, and take on four titans at once. She can deflect Robin's ranged attacks, send Cyborg flying with one swipe, and easily lift Lion Beast Boy. So surprisingly, this Chrysalis Eater is a very dangerous threat to the trained heroes. To even be able to hunt Tamaranians, who are by all accounts a strong warrior people, the Eater must also be strong. But note that she relies on manipulation and targets mainly the vulnerable Tamaranians as they go into a chrysalis. When it comes to a real fight, all of this tires out the slow moving monster. And once Starfire is back to her full power, it's the Eater that gets put on the menu. No one defeats Atlas. I demand a rematch. When inside his huge robot suit, Adonis can deal out a lot of damage while being unfazed by many types of attacks. Somehow, his suit even repels Raven's magic. And when he endures hits from Cyborg, it doesn't prove too much of an issue. But should the suit's wiring get exposed, it can short circuit and malfunction, which equates to instant defeat. If this was the only form we ever saw of Adonis, he'd be lower on this list. However, we do see two other versions, both of which are stronger. Beast Adonis nearly killed Raven when he attacked her by surprise. 
And like Beast Boy in the same form, he's shown to be able to take on 14 Titans at once without sustaining too much damage or tiring out. The only thing that stops him is someone in the same form with the same power. And by the episode Overdrive, Adonis has upgraded his original suit. Now he can throw cars way across the beach, easily launch heavy weights into the ocean, and lift a whole bus with ease. The only reason he isn't a major threat this time is that Cyborg had also gotten an upgrade. And powered by the Max 7, Cyborg makes quick work of Adonis with plenty of time left to spare. In his beast form or in the upgraded suit, I think Adonis could take down Cinderblock or Triton, but the Herald proves that Adonis is not indomitable. Both Adonis and Atlas lose to Panther, but I think between those two villains, Atlas is a bit stronger than Adonis. In the episode Only Human, Atlas is a seemingly insurmountable threat. When he punches the water, he creates huge bursts. Beast Boy as a whale drops on top of him, only for Adonis to pick him up and throw him a vast distance. He tanks so many hits from Cyborg to the extent that it pushes the Titan to his machine limits. And since these limits had not come up in a previous fight, it's a testament to Atlas's power that he very well might have been the strongest opponent Cyborg had faced up to that point in the show. For all his impressive weaponry and power though, Atlas needed his mechanic to repair and refit him. On his own, he can't reach that max strength. And when push comes to shove, Atlas loses to Cyborg's untapped human potential. Just three more terrifying creatures to go before we reach number one in the muscle category. First up is the radiation monster from the episode Snowblind. It's made out of radioactive waste and is essentially a walking time bomb. The radiation monster can do massive damage to entire towns and is unfazed by most attacks from the Titans. Its very composition messes with tech like cyborg sensors. It can break through Raven's magic and only Starfire can touch it because its radiation levels are off the scales. If the only one who could stand up to it is another nuclear fighter, Red Star, you might be wondering why the radiation monster isn't my number one pick. And that's simply because, left to its own devices, it will explode. As it keeps feeding on nuclear waste and expelling its power, the radiation monster grows closer to instability. So any hero or villain that plays keep away and stretches out the fight can eventually outlast the radiation monster. However, the alien Shrieker might be a bigger concern. It moves silently among pipes, makes screaming shockwaves that mess with Cyborg's tech and overwhelm the human senses, and keeps pushing opponents back while destroying the environment. The Shrieker barely reacts when Triceratops Beast Boy gets thrown at it and literally opens its mouth to eat one of Starfire's bolts and it doesn't even get heartburn. The Shrieker's hard shell and persistence make it like a massive tardigrade that keeps coming back for more and even survives in space. The only problem is that its killing instinct seems to be a bit mindless. The Shrieker keeps falling for the same kind of trick over and over. And when it falls for that last time, I'd personally like to think that it somehow still survived like it always does, but that could also just be wishful thinking on my part as a fan of my boy, the Shrieker. And second from the top is the strongest of Slade's living weapons, Plasmus. In the episode Divide and Conquer, we see both Cinderblock and Plasmus for the first time, but I think it's clear that Plasmus was the more persistent and dangerous threat. Every time they thought they'd taken it down or taken it apart, it would regrow or divide into multiple targets. And the thing with Plasmus is that he constantly gets stronger. In the episode Transformation, Plasmus starts to drink from sewer pipes beneath the ground and further mutates. In this second stage, he can reform even when his entire top half is blown up. He even survives being reduced to a puddle. 
and Plasmus still had this second form in Aftershock Part 1. He can be frozen solid, shattered, and continue reforming. Getting hit by an entire building isn't too big of a deal either. Whenever the sleeping man wakes up, he turns right back into the goo creature, always feasting, always growing, always adapting. At her peak powers, Raven can instantly defeat Plasmus by going inside and imploding the creature from within. But that's rare. Usually a fight against Plasmus is a big deal for the Titans, and is a longer fight where everyone has to be on their A-game. But at least we know they can defeat Plasmus, because they have a few times. But that's not the case for my number one pick, a villain so strong that he still remained undefeated when the series ended. In addition to having the same name as one of my favorite energy drinks, I think that the white monster from the episode Things Change is mainly a big metaphor. He is change personified. The white monster changes to adapt to anything he touches. He can turn into bricks, metal, liquid cement, water, oil, and probably anything else. If he touched radioactive waste, I bet he'd be a better version of the monster from Snowblind. And if he touched Plasmus, well, I think he would adapt his powers too. If you take the white monster as a literal opponent, I think he is terrifyingly strong. Because when he becomes a liquid, he adopts the properties of liquid and can slip through gutters and avoid sustaining any physical damage. The white monster is also imposingly large and a competent fighter that can catch Robin mid-air and swing him, as well as punch Dinosaur Beast Boy way the heck out of here. When he runs on all fours, he can outpace the Titans and keep them on their toes. I'm not sure if this is all a hot take, but I think not only is the white monster the strongest villain in the muscle category, it might be worth asking if any villain coming up later could even defeat it. Only time will tell. Here are the top 10 so far. If villains in the muscle category were the brawn, next up are some of the brains, the tech geniuses I'm going to call inventors. I'm sick of selling to bad boys. I'm ready to be one. While very talented inventors and engineers, neither Fixit nor Professor Chang are especially strong fighters. Fixit can levitate technology but we don't see him applying that to battle. And although he does have frightening robot helpers, I'm putting him a bit lower because it doesn't appear that they share any kind of beneficial hive mind. If he saw through their eyes or they communicated efficiently, he would have known that the Titans had arrived as soon as they started fighting his robots, but he was none the wiser. Professor Chang usually leaves the fighting to his henchmen, but he will get his own hands dirty and fire an energy beam at Robin if that's what the situation calls for. Professor Chang is one of the most ruthless villains in the series and surprisingly ubiquitous. He did the surgery on Brother Blood to give him some of Cyborg's power. He was the one that made Red Star into a super soldier and he is in charge of freezing the heroes for the Brotherhood of Evil. But in a direct fight, it's not surprising when he loses immediately to Masi Menos. After all, fighting is not Professor Chang's forte. Crud. Snot. Oh, mega crud. For my money, Gizmo is a bigger threat than fellow Hive 5 cohort Mammoth, because this small, foul-mouthed gremlin has a wide array of gadgets at his fingertips. He could shoot missiles, sprout spider-like legs, take flight, deceive others with holograms, trap fools inside of bubbles, and even shrink himself down to microscopic size. At the press of a button, he can don a mecha suit that shoots rockets, and Gizmo can hack into just about any hero's computers or mess with robotic bodies. But despite all of these cool tools, Gizmo just doesn't get a lot of wins. Cyborg takes him out in round one of the Tournament of Heroes pretty easily, because it turns out that all you gotta do is rip off his fancy backpack and Gizmo is reduced to nothing more than a snot-stained grunt slipper. And if that left a bad taste in your mouth, let me introduce Nufu. 
the most nutritious and delicious meat substitute in this video. He is the source, and at his command is a seemingly endless supply of bobs. Each bob is basically harmless, presumably no more dangerous than your average fast food manager. But when you've got dozens of them all running at you, then you're in for a McFlurry of hurt. They can tackle opponents and turn into a hardening ooze to trap them. And if you strike them down, they can quickly reform and seek their barbecue flavored revenge. But each Bob has the overload problem. They're instantly defeated by water. And the source himself is completely defenseless outside his machine case. If you have the stomach for it, then the solution becomes pretty obvious. Hey, big fella. Did Killer Moth create you in a lab? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Seymour was a pupil of Brother Blood in more ways than one. And while to his high five friends, he might be a sight for sore eyes, to his enemies, he's a pain in the you know where. He can turn the dial on his visor for x-ray vision. And if that's not a good enough view, he can float above the city and act as a scout. He can shoot eyeball-based projectiles, create shields strong enough to withstand Starfire's beams, and trap opponents in bubbles that are hard to burst, at least from the inside. He can also scan heat signatures and brainwash opponents, but neither was enough to save him from the Herald. And he's not the only villain that I would have wanted to see more of, because I'm something of a Killer Moth fan, I guess? He's such a hardworking and devoted dad that I'm even willing to overlook his hideous bug face. He's no Robin, but he's decent in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and he also has an energy whip that shocks and snares opponents. In closed environments, he can crawl on walls or hang on the ceiling, and in open areas, he can fly around to avoid enemy hits. While he is strong and agile, though, three titans are enough to make him submit. But Killer Moth is in the inventor category for a reason. His main weapon is his army of moth children. And I think it's fair that we let him have those for ranking purposes, because other inventors get their gadgets and weapons, and these moths are his bioengineered weapons. There's tons of them, and each one has a bite strong enough to chew through steel. This makes Killer Moth something of a soft barrier for entry. Any villain that I rank above him has to be capable enough to handle him and his moth army. It just so happens that I think there's four other inventors who likely could. I'd like to go to jail now, please. Dr. Light is something of a negative version of a gift that keeps on giving. At first, he is something of a joke. He can use light to blast away Robin or blind Beast Boy, and his energy force shield protects him from Starfire's bolts but Raven dialing up the darkness immediately takes him out and leaves him reeling. Next time Dr. Light shows up, he proves just how bad he is at planning things by setting up his base of operations directly in view of Titan's tower. But he's also stronger this second time. A single blast sends Cyborg flying into the sea and his light whip can snap Robin's weapon. And third time's the charm because near the end of the series, Dr. Light harnesses the power of the Northern Lights to increase his strength exponentially. With this new energy source, he can power through Raven's magic and be a real threat to all five Titans at once. He beats Cole and Gnark and traps Cole in a bubble before using her to further magnify his strength from the Northern Lights. While Dr. Light can sometimes be a joke villain, he consistently gets stronger. And I think if the show kept going and he kept this up, eventually he would rise as high as the sun. Provided, of course, that his wings didn't melt first. Warp's trajectory is less smooth. He has one main appearance in the series, and in that one episode, he's really strong. Like, impressively strong. He can shoot lasers at opponents. Simply wave his hands to deflect objects Raven throws at him, easily deflect Starfire's bolts with his hands, stun Beast Boy with electricity that makes him revert to human form, create force fields that block Cyborg's strongest attacks, and retaliate with throwing discs that drain Cyborg's power cell. Later on, he can freeze opponents, 
and hold his own in the future against Nightwing, but he seems weaker in Season 5, when Harold beats Warp and Seymour off screen. He isn't framed as a major threat outside the episode How Long Is Forever, but I still believe in Warp. I think if he and Dr. Light fought a dozen bouts, Warp would probably win at least seven of the twelve times. <laughs> times. Clocks. Etc. And it's high time someone taught you Sprogs a lesson. When it comes to the inventor-type villains of Teen Titans, I think the second best is Control Freak, while the number one spot goes to Mad Mod. Both of them seem like joke villains, memes, if you will, but actually, they pose a huge threat through how they distort reality. Cyborg says that Control Freak has, quote, enough high-end tech to break half the laws of physics, and with his remote control, Control Freak Mike TV'd himself into a broadcast waveform to move freely between the networks. He hops from screen to screen and network to network and sees all. Starfire says that inside the television, Control Freak is more powerful than Glothrock the All-Seeing. And I'll take Starfire's word for it that that's really impressive. Control Freak adapts his abilities to whatever show he's in. He can become a 12th level space samurai and use the Force, or something like it, in the Star Wars parody show. When he's in an action movie, Control Freak knows Kung Fu. And he also gains equipment from the broadcasts he visits, which in total gives him possession of a black belt in Astro Jitsu, the Bionic Hero's rocket boots, Benthar's wristbands of power, Captain Kalile's infamous Flabba Blaster, a grappling hook, and what's basically a lightsaber. One difference between Control Freak and Mad Mod is that Control Freak is a more capable fighter when it comes to direct encounters. He can use his remote to control electronics, make cash registers or movie shelves attack people, and even possess things like cardboard cutouts or candy. Most of these tricks are limited to movie paraphernalia, but on its own, the remote can be used to summon electronic transmissions of monsters from movies and TV shows. He develops weapons specific to his opponents, like these Cerberus-looking cannons that shoot missiles, or an atomic resistance capsule designed to trap Starfire. He somehow even has the ability to stop Speedy from using his arrows, even while not being anywhere around him. And when Jericho possesses him, Control Freak Saber is capable of swatting away Johnny Rancid, Kid Wicked, and Ding Dong Daddy, even if he can't cut through Trident's Trident. But Control Freak also has some silly weaknesses. Sprinklers instantly destroy his remote, so unless he upgraded later to some waterproof model, it's the overload problem all over again. And he also cowers in fear when he randomly and unexpectedly finds Silky. So it's not like the guy's got nerves of steel. In the episode For Real, it's stated that the Titans hadn't even put Control Freak on their bad guy list. A list that even included the Puppet King. And I think that's silly, to be honest. Because Control Freak represents a legitimate challenge, especially to unprepared opponents. But I also think Mad Mod is the bigger threat. He isn't as good in a direct fight, but with his superior powers of reality distortion, this Brit ain't daffing around. Mad Mod created a labyrinthian school prison for the Titans, full of holograms, illusions, and secret traps. He is a master at leading the Titans through hoops and getting under their skin with constant subversion and deception. His hypnotizing spirals can render someone a mindless, drooling mess, or be used on nearly anyone to make them bow to his every command. His staff can sap the youth from someone, and when he takes over the city, it doesn't seem like it's all a trick of the mind, but like, he actually changed reality somehow. Like how Larry's magic transformed the city in the episode Fractured. Because Mad Mod isn't much of a direct fighter, when it comes to stacking him up against other villains, I like to think of it this way. Do I believe that the other villain could make it through Mad Mod's warped school or his British invasion of the city? Is this villain strong enough to survive and smart enough to trick Mad Mod at his own games? For most of the villains I've talked about in both the muscle and inventor list, 
I think the answer is no. Mad Mod is a tough barrier for entry. I could see characters like Trident, Killer Moth, Adonis, and even Dr. Light getting stuck in Mad Mod's puzzles and never being able to escape, all while the Mastermind sits back for a spot of tea. When I combine the muscles and inventors, this is what I think the top 10 is so far. While it's anyone's guess how intelligent the white monster is, I think it's so durable that it could navigate Mad Mod's twisted worlds and take him down through sheer willpower. So as we move forward, Mad Mod and the white monster are the villains to beat. Next up are the spellcasters and enchanters, who I dub the magicians. We can't possibly defeat the puppet king. He is too clever and powerful, not to mention good looking. As far as I can tell, the Puppet King has one trick. It's a neat trick, don't get me wrong, but it's also a limiting trick that two Teen Titans very early in the show could beat. The Puppet King takes the souls of people and puts them into puppets, which then lets him control their bodies. But it looks like this plan only works if people sleep with their dummies, because if someone is awake, they can try to stop the soul transfer. And without his magic, the Puppet King is just a puppet. One capable of one-hit KOing Kilowatt, apparently, but also one that Moss on his own can simply punch out. The Witch is another hard one to rank because we don't really have a lot to go off of. In the episode Cyborg the Barbarian, she had to serve the one who had brought her back, which in this case was Crawl. But she kept twisting things to subtly go against him. He wanted to be a hero, so she sent hordes of monsters to fight that were way stronger than him. He wanted the power to defeat those creatures, so she sent Cyborg, who became the champion instead. And when Crawl asked to be made stronger, she turned him into a monster. Classic S-tier trolling from the witch. But we don't see her fight, and even her status as a villain could be debated. We know that she can send people through time, summon hordes of strong monsters, and turn people into monsters. She likely can teleport, without she abruptly and silently appears behind people. So it's entirely possible that she's actually way stronger than I'm giving her credit for. I said at the very beginning that I wasn't going to include villains that haven't been in a fight, and I made an exception for the witch. She just seems more important than that. But because she hasn't been in a fight, I also can't justify placing her any higher on this list. If she can summon monsters to fight for her, they could probably take out a lot of the source's bobs. But it would be nothing a strong titan couldn't handle. You fight like a boy. Kid Wicked is a largely unknown member of the High Five and Brotherhood of Evil. He creates portals that he can reach through or push opponents through. His silent teleportation can occur so quickly that he can even pop up in front of Kid Flash. His primary weapon appears to be his cape, which is sharp enough to cut metal and can trap people inside its fabric. I'd put Jinx one spot higher, but if you want a fuller explanation of her capabilities, I'd direct you toward my Who is the Strongest Titan video. The short version is that her powers of bad luck can make environmental hazards, and her Hex Blast can cut through things and attack her opponents at a range. While she can't teleport around like Kid Wicked, Jinx is super agile, and likely has more combat experience and attack options. Given that she was the de facto leader of the High Five for over four seasons, I suspect she'd be more than capable of putting Kid Wicked in his place. Simon has even less screen time than Kid Wicked, but since he can hold his own against Raven, I am making the bold assumption that he is pretty strong. Simon can create portals like Kid Wicked and the Herald, but he also has psionic brain attacks. I'm also taking a leap of faith that since he's an older member of the Brotherhood, he has more experience. But guessing all of these things is... frustrating. Almost as frustrating as Mother May I, am I right? From what I can tell, her episode is usually one of the lower rated among fans, 
And I'm sure that the Titans and Hive members who've had to put up with her also aren't too happy with the Green Old Witch. So Mother May I's gimmick is that she makes pies that brainwash people. It's sorta of similar to the Puppet King strategy, but I think it's more likely that people will consistently want to eat delicious pie than sleep next to some creepy doppelganger doll. Mother May I also has other powers and abilities. She can shape reality, like when she turns the Titan's tower into sugar, spice, and everything nice. She can disappear in a puff of pink smoke, use telekinesis to move small weapons or the big tea car, and a spin of her spoon binds Starfire in ribbon. Mother May I can fly on top of a giant pie in the sky, become enormous or make her enemies small, and uses gelatin, mason jars, melee purse attacks, and an army of gingerbread foot soldiers to sweeten the deal. But she can also be hurt by Starfire's blasts, and her mind control can wear off if she doesn't constantly feed her victims pie. A single bop to the head is enough to knock them back to their senses, and it's not all that hard to trick the witch. Since the Titans bestowed the cursed pie on the Hive Five next, and the Hive Five are shown later to be living to fight another day, I'm assuming that together they can also survive Mother May I. While I'm less sure that the Hive Five could beat the next two villains, even with all their powers combined. In his default human form, Johnny Rancid is a tough guy on a fast motorcycle with a blaster and a tendency to take risks. He'll taunt opponents to get under their skin, like when he provokes Robin into getting into an accident. Normally, he's faster on his bike than Pterodactyl Beast Boy or Raven and Starfire in flight. But when he's powered up, he can outpace even Mossy Manos. This power initially comes from the interdimensional something called Larry. And I would be less sure that Johnny Rancid would even get these powers for the sake of ranking if it wasn't for the fact that he continues to have these powers when we see him again later in season five. Somehow he got to keep them. Powered up Johnny Rancid has stronger ranged attacks, can fly around on his motorcycle, hacks giant Rancid loogies, can tear open the sky to pull people into clouds, and can even push through Raven's magic. Maybe this is a little thing to you, but I was also wowed when Johnny Rancid just, you know, hopped off his speeding motorcycle and ran behind it like it's no big deal. He's an odd fit for the magician category, I know, but his strongest powers are definitely magical in nature, even if they might not be as magically delicious as Mother May I's pies. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, it's Mumbo time. The Mumbo Jumbo is a truly bizarre villain who can alter reality, much like Control Freak and Mad Mod, and like the latter, it's also with a stick. Mumbo Jumbo has super speed, has incredible agility, and can hop inside of his hat for protection. He manifests items like bombs and flower shurikens. And to continue the trend from Simon and Johnny Rancid, yes, Mumbo is also shown to be able to override and overpower Raven's magic. With a simple open sesame, he can make bricks disappear long enough for him to pass through and then reappear right after. He can also manifest brick walls under his cape and turn Robin's staff into a snake, but he isn't exactly subtle, which makes him easy to track. And when Robin snaps his wand, Mumbo instantly loses his stage presence. When Mumbo Jumbo reappears in the Bunny Raven episode, his power is taken to another level. He can siphon cash into his hat, which seemingly has infinite space. And he can retrieve a coin, not from behind someone's ear, but from inside someone's ear. He turns the Titan's ranged attacks into flowers and concrete into doves, bombards Starfire with cards, and somehow disconnects his head from his neck and retracts it into his hat, you know, for safekeeping. Mumbo's hat can suck all the Titans inside like one of Harold's portals. And once they're there, he has total control over that fantastical space, very similar to what Mad Mod can do. He turns the Titans into animals and inanimate objects, but this is only possible when they are trapped inside of his hat. 
What makes determining his power scaling a bit tricky is that in a particular flashback, Terra took out Mumbo Jumbo in one hit because she got the drop on him. So here's my verdict. If you can catch Mumbo Jumbo off guard, you'll make quick work of him. Easy, no problem. But if he knows you're coming, he can dominate the whole exchange and turn your defeat into a wild performance. One where the final act might really be your curtain call. <laughs> Sweet Raven, you can't possibly hope to defeat me. I told you everything you know. Sometime long ago, the great evil dragon Malkior faced off against the powerful wizard Rorik. Because Malkior was stronger, Rorik could only find one way to defeat the wicked dragon, and that was by sealing him inside of a book. Far into the future, this book finds its way into Raven's hands, and Malkior cleverly tricks her into thinking that he was the hero, and thus wins her heart and convinces her to set him free. Once he's unleashed, it very much feels like Malkior could pose a threat not just to the city, but to the whole world. He tanks hits from all the titans at once and seems mostly unfazed. He breaks through the ceiling while in flight, easily tosses around T-Rex Beast Boy, can get into his opponent's heads using telepathy, and overpowers Raven's magic with his flame breath. The only way that Raven can stop him is by sealing him back in the book. I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that Malkior is a stronger magic user than any of the villains so far. This ain't amateur hour any longer. I think he could overpower Mother May I and burn Mumbo to a crisp. And if the episode Spellbound was Malkior's only appearance, I'd probably be here arguing that he would beat the white monster from Things Change. Because I'd be wondering if Malkior was like, strong as a god. But there's a problem. And that problem's name is the Herald. Because he makes such short work of Malkior that I have to factor that into my ranking. Malkior is no doubt the strongest magician, but the Herald took him out in a few seconds. So here's the top 10 so far. Between Control Freak, Mad Mod, and Mumbo Jumbo, there's arguments to be tossed around for each reality distorter but I think Control Freak is the most limited and also the easiest to trick. Mumbo Jumbo then has the edge over Mad Mod, because while I think Mumbo could play Mad Mod's game and survive his surreal gauntlet, I don't think, conversely, that Mad Mod could keep up with Mumbo in a direct fight. Before we get to the big bads, the main villains of each season, there's quite a few miscellaneous villains to cover. Since they don't fit neatly into the category of muscle, inventor, or magician, these are the others. And unless you want me to let those nasty bugs out for a late night snack, you better pack her up! These first three can be dismissed real fast. Kitten is surprisingly resourceful in her fight against Starfire, but she doesn't have any superpowers or any combat training. She only really becomes a threat when she gets the help of her daddy dearest. Andre LeBlanc waited until the Titans were out of town because he knew he couldn't beat them. And when he does make his move, the Titans East swoop in and quickly apprehend him. Later, he gets so scared by the mere sight of Beast Boy that he instantly passes out. Sure, he has bombs and dynamite, but not much else in his repertoire. For ranking purposes, Ding Dong Daddy gets his car, because it's his main weapon, and he has it in Titans together. His car is tricked out with many gadgets, weapons, and functions. He can shoot a neutralizer beam that somehow prevents opponents from flying, he can cause oil slicks, freeze roads, and more. Certainly, the hardest part about facing Ding Dong Daddy is catching up with him. But once you do catch up with him, you can waste him in one hit. I'm sorry, Daddy-o, but... Your bird is cooked. Get your hands off my girl. XL Terrestrial can push a button on his chest and turn huge. I'm sure this makes him physically stronger and more resistant to damage. And I know that I certainly wouldn't want to run into XL Terrestrial in a dark alley or anywhere else really. But since Tram the Fish Boy can win against him, I wouldn't place your bets on an XL Terrestrial sweep. Another minor Hive student turned Brotherhood of Evil Hitman is Angel, 
who can fly and use her big wings to trap and stun opponents. All we have to go off of is that, together with Punk Rocket, she was able to send Bumblebee into retreat, but they also, together, weren't able to actually catch her. Whereas at least Fang gave the Titans a hard time in his episode Date with Destiny. With his spider head legs, he is adept at traversing buildings, and he can spit super loogies that stick opponents to surfaces, and which he later uses to gunk up the Herald's horn. Fang does well against Robin in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and can, somehow, fire a pink energy capable of paralyzing people. Alas, when he joins forces with Private Hive to take down Jericho, he loses off-screen, and most Titans could probably defeat Fang in a 1v1 situation. But rest assured, when the tournament is complete, there will be magnificent prizes. Lord Trogar appears in the prequel episode Go as the first villain the Titans ever faced and defeated. As such, he lost to the Titans at their least powerful and least coordinated in the series. However, in his defense, Trogar is definitely imposing. He rules over a vast army of alien invaders. He can extend his claws to slice up the opposition, and he has super strength alongside good endurance. Certainly a respectful showing from our new alien overlord. Next up is the Master of Games, and to clarify, this is the Master of Games after he's already stolen several heroes' abilities. Thanks to his amulet, he attains the flame powers of Hotspot, the strength of Gorilla Beast Boy, Gizmo's mechanical spider legs, and Cyborg's arm cannon. However, importantly, he is not stronger with any of these abilities or weapons than the people that he's stealing from. He lacks training on how to use any of these tools proficiently, and Robin on his own was doing pretty well against him. If I was ranking base form Master of Games, he'd be much lower, because even when he does have these powers, he's still no match against true heroes. The Master of Games really shouldn't have skipped leg day. You're a good man, and a really good thief. Not to mention what a heck of a good looking fella, Billy. While some of the ones so far have been pushovers, these last five in the other category aren't to be underestimated. First up is Punk Rocket, who uses his sonic blast to blow back orchestras and audience members in the Lost episode. These sonic blasts deflect shots from Cyborg's arm cannon and push back Beast Boy even in elephant form. When he plugs in his guitar to big amps and speakers, his powers magnify, and the resulting sonic blasts mess with Cyborg's systems. Punk Rocket is great at dodging attacks and joins the ranks of other villains who can keep up with Robin in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But despite his flight powers and everything I've mentioned so far, it's hard for him to actually defeat anyone. And he ultimately gets beat by the Titans when Beast Boy tricks him into cranking the volume too much and blowing out his whole system. Oh, Billy Numerous, you strange hillbilly clone man, you. His duplication powers are fantastic in his debut episode, Overdrive. Multiple Billies can carry tons of gold bars with combined strength that surpasses Mammoth's earlier. The Billies can overwhelm Robin and descend en masse upon Starfire. Even Cyborg on the Max 7 upgrade can't deal with them all. At one point, he makes enough Billies that they can work together to literally move a bridge across the city. They climb each other like ladders to reach greater heights, and somehow, when the Billies duplicate, they also, like, duplicate the cash in their hands? Which, theoretically, you'd think could apply to other things, like weapons. Imagine if Billy Numerous had a gun, and then he split into, like, 30 Billies, each with a gun. But Billy Numerous gets outsmarted when Cyborg and the other Titans deploy holograms. Billy reaches a point where he can't divide himself any further, and as a result, all the Billies fuse back together at once, and for some reason explode. By the episode Lightspeed, Billy Numerous has joined the High Five, and he already feels nerfed. Billy and Gizmo lose to Cole and Gnark, which still doesn't feel right to me. For power scaling purposes, keep in mind that Dr. Light had beat Cole and Gnark previously. If Billy Numerous was a tactical genius, I think he'd be terrifying, but he never sets his sights high enough and tragically gets reduced to villain of the week status. Oh, Billy. I always was the better fighter. 
Cheshire is another one of those cases where less screen time is actually beneficial. And that's because Cheshire completely owns Speedy in their fight. She skillfully leaps from trees and makes most of her body invisible to blend into the environment. Incredibly, she simply waves away Speedy's arrows and swiftly defeats him by using her claws to cut apart his bow before channeling her inner Willow Smith to whip him with her hair. I'm on record saying that Speedy is the strongest member of the Titans East. So when she defeats him so clearly and so easily, that's an impressive feat. If we saw more of Cheshire, maybe I'd feel confident enough to put her ahead of Blackfire. But as things stand, I'm going to prop up the would-be Queen of Tamaran. Blackfire can approach the speed of light and traverse through black holes and event horizons. She knows alien martial arts and strength-wise is around where Starfire is. That said, despite how Blackfire keeps claiming she was always the better fighter, her record is 0-2. Even with the Jewel of Charta, which Blackfire claims makes her invincible, even with all that extra firepower and her force fields and her ruthless aggression, she again underestimates Starfire and loses to her sister. Those two losses look bad, but that's against one of the strongest Titans. If they clashed on the battlefield, I think Blackfire could defeat Speedy, just like Cheshire had. But I doubt that either of those villains could win against my number one pick in this other category. And that's none other than... Come on, kids. X marks the spot. Red X is stronger than every other villain in this miscellaneous category, and I don't think it's even close. If Blackfire is a weaker Starfire, then you could say Red X is a stronger Robin. But I think even that is selling him a bit short. Red X is a match for Robin's acrobatics, an intense fighting style, yes, but Red X also has some of the most useful equipment and weaponry in the whole series, of either a hero or a villain. His X projectiles trap people in goo, strong enough to bind Rhino, Beast Boy, and Raven close together like the shippers would want, and launch them without snapping. Like how Robin, when he was in the suit, used an X to cover Raven's mouth to prevent her from casting spells, I assume that Red X would use that on the Herald like how Fang gunked up his horn. Other variants of the X projectile can be thrown shuriken style at the ground and explode with a delay. His X's can also short circuit technology, for example, Cyborg's body. Red X's suit lets him phase in and out physically to go through people and presumably to go through walls and he can shoot red beams out of his hands that bounce off metal to paralyze strong opponents like Starfire. When Robin was Red X, he was able to get the upper hand over his friends because he knew their weaknesses. Although it's unclear exactly how Red X knows what he knows, this new and improved iteration seems just as capable of exploiting his opponent's flaws. He leaves his 1v5 matchup against the core Titans virtually unscathed. And in addition to all the tricks we see him pull off in his limited screen time, I wouldn't be surprised if there's even more where that came from. Although he isn't evil or bent on taking over the world, Red X is one of the most capable opponents the Titans have ever faced. I think Red X could handle Mad Mod's tricks, whether it's playing hooky at his twisted school or staging a one-man revolution against a British dystopia. But a fight against Mumbo Jumbo could go either way, if Red X gets the jump on him, it's over for the Magician. But if Mumbo knows he's coming, then Red X might be in over his head with the Master's tricks. So, again, could go either way. Like I said from the start, there's a lot of situational factors. Like, I think Red X might be able to handle the Herald better than Malkior, even if Red X might lose to Malkior most days of the week. But with every other villain out of the way, all that's left are the big bads the main villains of Teen Titans, from the weakest to the strongest. Together you may be formidable, but apart, you are lost, powerless, mind. Intellect personified and evil incarnate is a brain in a jar. The brain can hook up to weapons and technology, but if we're ranking villains by how strong they are in a fight, um... This is a brain in a jar, 
And while I'm willing to give like the source his bobs because they're they're literally made from him or Killer Moth has his moths, I don't think that any readily available minion at the brain's disposal is going to change his situation. He's a great mastermind, but not exactly a fighter. Meanwhile, General Immortus certainly is a fighter, if not the quintessential fighter, and he lives up to his name. He is an immortal general who knows the strategy of every battle in history, because he was there to see it. In terms of war tactics, none would rank higher. He leads the Doom Patrol into a trap of magnetic mines and rides alongside his army in a tank. With a small troop of flying soldiers, he also successfully captured the honorary titan, Argent. But I think General Immortus is only as strong as the soldiers with him, and any opponent that can handle them well will be able to reach him and take the old man out. We never see General Immortus himself fight, and I'm not inclined to believe he's in the best of shape for an intense scrape against someone like Robin. Master, it is time we left. Agreed. Monsieur Mala's strength is said to be matched only by his intelligence. And his strength is that of a big gorilla. Gorillas on their own are scary and dangerous animals. But this one can wield firearms. Mala goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the physically strongest member of the Doom Patrol, Robot Man. And he's surprisingly stealthy and sneaky. That said, Mala isn't higher on this list, because opponents like Bobby the Bear can give him a thrashing. And in their final showdown, Gorilla Beast Boy defeats him on his own. But you shall never get the chance. Erase them. For those of you patiently wondering where the trouble in Tokyo representation is at, this one's for you. While the Titans face multiple opponents in the movie, they are all made from one source, Brushigan. So I'm counting them all as part of him. This includes Psychotech, a flying hero with exploding shurikens who on his own can efficiently hold back the Titans. Dekamido, a giant Godzilla-like kaiju who shoots lasers from his eyes, spits slime, regenerates its body, and literally doesn't react to getting struck by launched vehicles. Timoko, a mecha monstrosity that uses its big arms and blades to slice and dice Cyborg for dinner. Nyanya, a skilled acrobatic fighter that can disguise her appearance and beat Beast Boy when his guard's down. Mecha Boy, an Astro Boy looking rocket out of the mouth ejecting flying menace. Scarface, a phantom that passes through solid objects and haunts Raven. And the Tokyo Troopers at Daizo's disposal. All of these, Brushigan can make, and make many of. A long time ago, Brushigan used dark magic to bring his creations to life. But he ended up getting stained by the darkness. His skin became paper, and ink flowed through his veins. He became one of the first supervillains in Japan. But for him, even the so-called end wasn't the end because Uihara Daizo made him his slave and forced him to continue making these awful monsters. When Daizo throws himself into Brushigan's printer, he becomes a gigantic ink monster. And this is the main form I'm thinking of when I'm ranking Brushigan. The ink that drops from this Daizo Brushigan fusion becomes troopers, psychotech duplicates, etc. Maybe these versions are weaker than the originals, or maybe they're more easily defeated because the Titans can now choose who they're going to be fighting against and they're not caught off guard. But whatever the case is, the heroes manage to take on a big group of them. Not to mention that water is shown to dissolve these machinations. Come to think of it, Brushigan and his products are basically the most beefed up version of the Source and his Bobs. And while Daizo Brushigan is huge and terrifying and very dangerous, if you remove Brushigan, Daizo has no power. The giant collapses and all the ink creatures melt. So victory largely depends on how quickly the opponent can pinpoint this weakness while also surviving the onslaught of ink creatures. This is something that I think the next highest villain would be more than equipped to handle. You are the only one who has ever been able to resist me, and I don't like it.
I don't think I'm alone in feeling kind of meh on Brother Blood. He wasn't as interesting to me as the other main villains before him or the one after. But I think in terms of sheer power, Brother Blood is worthy of recognition and fear. His main superpower is mind control, which he uses to control the students at Hive Academy. Students, I remind you, with superpowers of all types, and they all fall to his will, even the strong-willed Bumblebee. It seems the only mind Brother Blood can't control is Cyborg's, and he gets so fixated on that fact that he asks Professor Chang to modify his own body to be like Cyborg's. Even before that, when Cyborg uses the Ion Amplifier, something that was supposed to amplify his power to unimaginable levels, Brother Blood is able to quickly deflect it and totally resist that amplified attack. When a giant sonic blast goes off that causes Cyborg to reel in agony, Brother Blood simply stands there, unfazed. He easily dodges Cyborg's blasts and punches, and since he can read Cyborg's blueprints and knows his weaknesses, I think it's safe to assume that when he had his own body augmented, he built around those weaknesses and probably had the design improved. This is all to say that I think Brother Blood should have been able to defeat Cyborg at the end of Season 3. He was dominating the fight and slicing Cyborg apart up until the point where the plot had to have Cyborg win. And through the power of sheer human will, Cyborg ended up victorious. I don't buy it. Like, yes, it literally happened in the show, but I'm hesitant to count it against Brother Blood. This is the man who survived being blasted by all the Titan Z security and launched out the tower. This is the man who can hold both Titans East and the core Titans at once in a paralyzing energy without even breaking a sweat. This is the man that can make Cyborg feel like his arm is really still there. And I have no doubts that his powers of persuasion and effects on the human psyche go beyond even what we saw in the show. And just like he studied and adapted to Cyborg, Given enough time, I think Brother Blood would study and adapt to any other opponent too. Brother Blood is obsessive, ruthless, cunning, and dominant. Which sort of reminds me of this other guy. I am the thing that keeps you up at night. The evil that haunts every dark corner of your mind. Slade is easily the most iconic villain in the series and a real fan favorite. He's sort of like Robin if Robin was a lot stronger and abandoned any sort of connection or moral principle that would restrain him from going fully aggressive. Slade usually stays in the background and lets hired hands do the dirty work, or he'll send in a robot army, or he'll make robot versions of himself that are programmed to act just like the real thing. But when he actually does go into the battlefield, Slade is one of the most threatening foes that any hero could encounter. Slade is eerily calm and collected as he unrelentingly taunts his opponents and messes with their minds. While he doesn't have mind control like Brother Blood, he has his own ways of getting into someone's psyche. He can tank hits from someone as strong as Robin and show no outward sign of pain, distress, or exhaustion. But in those rare moments where he is caught off guard or overwhelmed by his own anger, Slade can be vulnerable. Like when Robin beats him at his own game by making a choice Slade never would have thought of, and that's sacrificing himself for his friends. So defeated, Slade loses his signature cool and pays the price for it. Slade can hold his own against Beast Boy, whether he's in the form of a tiger or a gorilla or a bear. While we also see him smacking around Terra, that's because he has a psychological hold on her. He knows that she's stronger than him, which is why he wants her under his thumb in the first place. That's the thing about Slade. He knows when he's outmatched. So if he's not the strongest, he'll play what cards he has and do whatever it takes to survive, endure, and outlast. I'd pay good money to see a proper fight between Slade and Brother Blood. I think it would be close, especially if both have time to study each other and develop a strategy. I wonder if Slade's victory might hinge on his ability to resist Brother Blood's mind control. 
This is, of course, speculation and opinion, but I think Slade would have the mental fortitude to resist. I think Slade would be able to maintain his calm, while Brother Blood would be enraged that he can't crack Slade's mind. This, in turn, would give Slade the edge and make Brother Blood too hasty and too desperate. And this isn't even Slade at his strongest. But, of course, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Perhaps you are wanting to fight me too? I'm sure a nice lady like you wouldn't want to fight me. I would not be so sure. Look, I love Slade. He's one of my favorite villains ever, and easily my favorite bad guy in Teen Titans. But I gotta call them like I see them. And I think Madame Rouge could probably defeat Slade in a straightforward fight. Madame Rouge can stretch and extend her body to wild proportions. It lets her wrap around men and squeeze them until they pass out. She packs a punch, too, enough to create small impacts on the ground with a single hit. Her body can almost liquefy through grating and fences, and in general, she's excellent at dodging thrown objects and twists her body around attacks. The Brain at one point refers to Madame Rouge as his best operative, and I think at least part of that has to do with her tactical prowess. She lures opponents into isolated, vulnerable locations, like when she chases Wildebeest to a cliff and captures him. She tricks Hotspot into powering down and can shapeshift her body to appear just like other people. She can even mimic their voices. While occasionally she will slip up and say something conspicuous, a good 80% of the time, she's excellent at impersonating. Madame Rouge can survive being imploded and always reforms after being seemingly defeated. She's another villain that can keep up with Robin in hand-to-hand -hand fights, and furthermore, she actually defeats Robin and captures him for the Brotherhood of Evil. At one point, she extends her arm far enough and fast enough to catch Kid Flash when he's running at super speed. There isn't much that Madame Rouge can't do, but I suppose she does have a weakness. Her body begins to melt when she's around Hotspot, and her hands burn when she touches him. It looks like her body might be made out of wax, or something like that. While she can reform upon being frozen and shattered, if you don't shatter her, she can stay frozen. So there are probably ways to work around her regeneration and elasticity if you melt or freeze her. One last thing about Madame Rouge. Mento claims that he can't read Rouge's mind because it's, quote, just too twisted, which could mean that she'd resist Brother Blood's control. But it could also be a total nonsense excuse from Mento. Like, imagine if Mento from Teen Titans tried to read the Joker's brain. Would he also say that it's too twisted? Would he say that Poison Ivy's mind is too thorny? And Scarecrow, would he say that his head is made out of straw and therefore he just can't do it? Would Mento say that reading Mr. Freeze is too dangerous because it'll give him brain freeze? I don't know, Mento. Maybe you're just kind of bad. What stings the most? That I tricked you? That I nearly wiped out your team? That everyone liked me better than you? Or is it that deep down inside you really believed I was your friend? Okay, so like with Jinx, I've already said my piece about Terra in the previous ranking video. Therefore, this is just a recap. Terra's Earth powers can cause earthquakes and environmental disasters. Under Slade's influence, her powers awaken to create golems and earth-shattering abilities that send all the core titans reeling. And she can defeat Robin solo and Raven solo under the potential stipulation that Raven maybe isn't giving 100%. Unless she is, you can debate that. Regardless, I would wager that Terra's raw power is stronger than Slade's. And with further training and experience, she probably could have controlled Molten Rock at will and wield the strongest elemental power in the series. Terra versus Madame Rouge is another fight that I would gladly pay to see. If we take peak Terra from Aftershock Parts 1 and 2, and directed all of her rage at Madame Rouge, I think Terra could eventually win over the Brotherhood of Evil's best agent. And that's mainly because if she pulled that stunt against Madame Rouge that she pulled against Slade, I think she would end up melting Madame Rouge in magma. 
And even before that, Madame Rouge would have a very hard time getting Terra to quit. I think Brother Blood, Slade, Madame Rouge, and Terra are all very close in power. Pit any of them against each other and you'd be in for quite the showdown. So there's a lot of wiggle room here for who beats who, and I fully acknowledge that. But with the next pick, I think there really is only one way it could go. This is an escalation in power so sharp that no one else up to this point would stand a chance. I was beginning to think I'd never see your smiling faces again. Slade's back, baby. And this time he has the Mark of Scath. This is the version of Slade in season four, the one resurrected from the pit to make sure that the portal does her job. And he's different enough from original flavor Slade that I think he should get a separate spot in the ranking. Scath Slade has flame powers, which not only makes sense given who brought him back and where he's probably returning from, but also it's pretty poetic considering the way he was taken out by Terra. Anyway, Scath Slade creates vortexes of fire that shield him from blasts, and he encases his weapon in flames intense enough to melt through Robin's staff. In addition to fire, he can also command electricity with devastating results. He can knock four titans unconscious and hold them in the air, like how Brother Blood had once. At one point, he's totally frozen in ice, but then just shakes out of it. The Mark of Scath lets him resist Raven's ability to stop time. And the real kicker? No matter how many times Robin hits him, his head cracks back. It's like he can't die. He dodges Starfire's attacks, teleports, demolishes buildings, and generally does whatever needs to be done to deliver the message. Even when Raven pulls him out of his portal, flings him like a ragdoll against walls, and hits him with pillars and blows him up, Scath Slade is unscathed. When Cyborg plugs himself into the tower and becomes the last line of defense with two extreme arm cannons locked on Slade, yep, you guessed it. It doesn't even matter. Terra may have defeated regular Slade, but Scath Slade would rise from the magma with fight still in him, and Madame Rouge can't fight her fate forever. A genius intellect and a ruthless cunning spirit have been reborn through flames as an undead messenger of the apocalypse. And yet, for all his power, there is one who is clearly stronger. One who reigns supreme. You mortals provide excellent sport, though your fight, like your lives, is pointless. You knew this was coming, right? From the get-go, once I started this whole project, I figured this was the foregone conclusion. Trigon is the most powerful villain in Teen Titans. Who else could it be? He appears on Earth and immediately seizes control of the world. He casts the skies in red, lays waste to a city in ruins, and petrifies the populace in stone. Slade tells the Titans that traveling to Earth sapped much of Trigon's power. So what we see isn't even him at full strength. Trigon is all-seeing and knows every plan that the Titans are hatching. He knows where they are at all times, despite their pitiful efforts to distract him. Sitting in his makeshift throne, he is unfazed by Starfire's bolts or any of the Titans' ranged attacks. Even when the Titans harness some of Raven's residual power and Trigon starts to take notice of their efforts, he simply smiles and blasts them away, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson swatting away some insects. At one point, Beast Boy turns into a hummingbird and flies into Trigon's ear before becoming a huge whale inside his red skull actually fulfilling something similar to that joke people would make about Ant-Man versus Thanos. But all this seems to do is give Trigon a bad migraine. Since fighting the Titans is beneath him, he summons their evil counterparts and keeps them occupied until Robin's return with Child Raven. Ultimately, Trigon's undoing is his overconfidence that Raven couldn't possibly pose a threat to him. But when Raven realizes the support of her found family, and harnesses her righteous indignation, she's able to finally stand up to her so-called father. In one blast, she not only casts Trigon out, but returns life to a barren world. But if Raven wasn't there, and hadn't tapped into 100% of her power, 
There's no doubt that Trigon would have won. He could create great chasms in the earth and tear the sky with his finger. A single shot from his eye immobilized four titans, and that would have been the end of them if Slade hadn't interfered. Yes, the titans are able to do some harm to Trigon without Raven, but all it took to knock them and Slade out was one blast from Trigon's eyes. None of them ever really posed a threat to his rule. And that's why Trigon is, without a doubt. Wait, wait a second. Okay, it looks like I've scribbled something in my notes. I crossed out Trigon's name and wrote something above it. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I see now. That, that makes sense. <clears throat> and that's why I'm proud to announce that the strongest villain in Teen Titans is the Bearded Man. He's clearly in charge of the villains on the bus in Revved Up, and the only reason he would be put in charge of the villains on the bus is if he himself was the number one villain, above all others, undisputed, greatest of all time, the Bearded Man. All jokes aside, here is my full ranking of all 62 villains, sans the Bearded Man. This is obviously very subjective and in no way an exact science, but it was fun to think about and put together. If you're surprised to see that the white monster from Things Change made it as far as it did, or you think I'm overrating any particular villain in this list or underrating a villain in this list, I'd be curious to hear your counter arguments in the comments, provided that you're polite and respectful to everyone who may disagree. And since this is a fairly niche topic and I'm a small channel, if you enjoyed this video, I'd also appreciate it if you'd throw me a like with the thumbs up to feed the algorithm monster. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Ciao.